Helen Kim. Good evening. Good evening, Helen. There has been uh, a lot of talk tonight about competition, about convincing companies to relocate to Philadelphia, whether they're coming from Boston or San Francisco or Malvern, for that matter. And, and a lot of people have been asking about tax structure and, and the BIRT and, and the wage tax and all of that. So for years, we have been tragically conscious of uh, gun violence in Philadelphia, of street crime in Philadelphia. For, for whatever reason, and, and, and you can argue about the whys and wherefores, this whole crisis has ramped up, uh, not just quantitatively, but almost qualitatively in the last several years. And my view, and I'm not an expert, that's for sure, but my view is that there is a visceral problem with asking companies to relocate to Philadelphia right now because Philadelphia's crime problem has become very much uh, of a public, publicly known problem, not just within the city and not just within the region, but throughout the country. What can Philadelphia do? What can the mayor do to put this crime crisis and start contracting it as opposed to expanding it so we can compete economically with other cities? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad that you mentioned that, Jim. Thank you so much. Um, the mayor's job, my job as mayor, is to make sure that every Philadelphian is safe and feels safe. That is very clear. This is a leadership issue. It's one that requires the coordination and um, integration of multiple different departments. It's one of the reasons why the crime problem is not that easy to fix. You're not just running a bunch of agencies. You're actually pulling a lot of different entities together who are responsible for crime, whether it's uh, making sure that the school district, our SEPTA departments, whether it's federal, state, and uh, law, uh, local law enforcement working together, the sheriff's department and the district attorney, our prisons, um, returning, you know, multiple different agencies are accountable to this issue. That's what the mayor has to do. We have $170 million in, um, in anti-violence programs without any clear strategy for what actually is supposed to happen. We are clear that we have to solve homicides and non-fatal shootings. We are clear that we have to reduce 911 response times and make sure that anyone who picks up the phone on 911 gets a response within 10 seconds, gets the phone picked up within 10 seconds and a response um, within five minutes. We've got to make sure that young people who are in the path of violence are actually getting the interventions that they need because the mayor's job is to provide the housing, the health care, the mental health services, family and uh, education and employment services that actually prevent crime and not just punish it. Um, but I think that that message has to go out loud and clear. It's one of the reasons why our public safety plan um, is one of the most comprehensive that we've got and why the mayor will be able to lead on this issue. Um, and, and I think make assurances to businesses because this is, the, this is one of the most serious issues about business attraction. Would your budget include money to hire more cops? The budget has 1,300 vacancies right now for police officers. We should fill all the vacancies. And how do you fill them? Why aren't they filled? Why, how would you fill them? So among the things, we need to hold uh, certain programs accountable, including a, a botch program called the Heart and Lung Program, which at one point was 19 individuals, is today almost 600 or so. Maybe it's gone down a little bit since, the, since there's been some public amount of shaming about it, um, but that's very clear. I think we've got to have a good program for how policing works in this 21st century. Um, it's one of the reasons why I've talked about as we do community policing models and work to get and deploy more foot patrols out into communities, that the mayor needs to be very present and visible with everybody right now. You don't not only want your police officers to see you out there with them um, as the mayor, but you also want to assure communities that this interaction is going the way we want. Um, we want to make sure that we have new models of community policing where we get 
our police officers and district captains engaging at the local level um, with communities so that they can be much more responsive about area hotspots, how they want to see redeployment, communities experience and need their police officers to do different things. It's not a one-size-fit-all kind of program. And as mayor, I'll help lead that kind of model to be the truly community responsiveness model that I think people want to see and that good police officers want to be part of. I just asked Alan uh, Dom about a perception, whether it's right or wrong, and I want to ask you about a perception of Helen Gim, whether it's right or wrong. But, but you know, as well as I, better than I, that there's a perception out there uh, that Helen Gim is progressive and anti-development, anti-business. Do you want to respond to that? I think it's bullshit. <laughs> and here's why. Um, because it is ridiculous to say that progressive policies, things that promote uh, the living wage, um, that, that support healthy businesses, that support unionization, are automatically by impact going to be anti-business. I think that that is an unhealthy way of looking at how we're going to grow the city, about what we actually need, about how workers desperately need to see their, uh, to see their livelihoods rise in a city where uh, we're at $7.25 an hour, whereas New Jersey right now is competing at $15 an hour for starting salaries starting when you're 16 years old. Um, there has to be the antiquated mindset that pro-worker is anti-business needs to be laid on the trash pile. And we need to go forward because this Philadelphia has to see something bold and transformative, and it's got to both lift up workers and it can make our city prosperous as well. Um, if we take the idea that we're pitting workers against businesses, we all lose. And we've already seen that happen because in fact, uh, Pennsylvania's business growth and job growth has slowed compared to surrounding areas which actually have higher minimum wages, which have better benefits. Um, we need to be, you, we want to talk about competition, we want to be competitive for an educated, activated, and excited workforce that wants to stay here in Pennsylvania because they also see opportunity for themselves, not just for the wealthiest CEOs. Thank you, Helen. Della? Um, Helen, in a traditional job, typically an employer will put you on, a, on your first 90 days and sit down with you for an evaluation. So as mayor, what would your 90-day evaluation look like and what would have been your priority um, that you would have accomplished? Um, thank you for that. So I think my first 90 days, obviously, is going to restore the sense of safety and community back to our city. That requires, I said very early on, I do want to be on the ground. I think it's important for a mayor to be visible right now on public safety, to be visible in communities. And I think it's important for our city workforce to see a mayor who's out there being supportive, whether it's on um, supporting our city workers, being active and engaged on um, making sure that people feel like their work is really valuable right now. Uh, whether we are delivering water or whether we are doing uh, trash pickups or whether we are policing on the streets. Um, that is incredibly important. Second, it is extremely important that I be evaluated on my ability to deliver a budget to the city of Philadelphia that actually elevates our public school system. One of the biggest problems that we, probably I think that this next budget by the mayor, by the 100th mayor, will be the most important budget for our public school system because 99 mayors before me has basically turned their back on our public schools or failed to fulfill their promise. It is time for us to deliver a big budget that the city and that the, uh, our institutions can buy into. That includes a big effort to modernize our public schools, to make sure that young people have the resources that they need both after school during PHL pre-K, um, that we will continue to fund um, summer school programs and other opportunities. Um, and I absolutely want to make sure that we support teaching and education in the city. Um, we need to get our, our uh, teachers back in. I will tell you that if I told you that there's a company out there that is having 1,000 jobs at $50,000 a piece, 50 to $60,000 a piece with full benefits, all of us in this room would be doing backflips and somersaults to get that company here. Well, that company is the School District of Philadelphia out there hiring 1,000 teachers right now, and we need to be doing everything we can to keep those 
um, individuals here and active. Just one final question. As you think about public safety, uh, education, and some of your priorities, are you forming a group of individual CEOs or business or community people that will help guide these policies? Could you tell us what that would look like? Um, so one of the first things that we'll do is absolutely set around a, a, a large stakeholder table. Um, during the work that I did around one of my largest uh, labor bills, Fair Work Week, we had a large 80-person um, business labor roundtable. It was multiple stakeholders around. It's really important to do that rather than to separate everybody from one another and not hear the different ways in which choices, decisions, and other types of things uh, balance against one another. Um, we had multiple different conversations before we ever introduced a bill. And then after we introduced a bill, uh, we had multiple different conversations to, to do probably almost 100 different adjustments, amendments, and other types of things to move the bill to completion. Um, that's my approach and attitude when I take on difficult and hard issues. Bringing people together, especially when we face some of the most uncertain and uh, consequential decisions of our lifetime, is not just a skill set, it's a way in which transformation happens. People cannot just go along thinking that their positions are, you know, kind of reduced in an echo chamber. Um, one of the biggest challenges we have is moving Philadelphia out of its silos, having to stop, think so narrowly about the impact on narrow sectors and try to think about what I think should be the primary role of the mayor to pursue the public interest, what helps get everybody to the table to raise up prosperity, to excite economic opportunity, and to move the city forward. Thank you. Bill? Helen. Um, I'm going to close with how I've done with everybody, which is to thank you for your public service uh, in your years. Um, I may get this wrong, so let me, you can correct me if I do. I think you had a recent tweet where you, I think, said, you're not going to run Philadelphia like a business. And so I'm wondering if I'm a business person in Philadelphia, and I'm paying BERT and UNO and real estate taxes, what is my mayor telling me when, he's, when, when she says she's not going to run it like a business? You forgot the second part to it. Okay, correct me. So I said I'm running Philadelphia like it's home and we're all family and we don't leave anybody behind. The mayor's role is, um, is to support the public interest. Um, there's a big difference because taxes aren't just about business interests. They are impactful of business. There is absolutely no question. But the business taxes do fund a whole host of city services that are essential to the running of a business, including safety, including cleanliness, including education and access to a quality workforce, including uh, services that address homelessness, mental health addictions, outreach to communities. This is a diverse and challenging and broad-based uh, challenge um, that goes out for the mayor. And so the mayor's interest is to balance all of those things. I have made clear that the cities of the future are going to rely on a heavy residential base. We are seeing a massive transformation in cities, that it is not just about large capital towers, corporate towers, if jobs are remote. I need jobs, when I talk about jobs, I need the employees to come live in Philadelphia in a remote world environment, no matter how much we may want to institute or issue edicts about coming into work, there is a generational shift around COVID. This is not just, um, or a generational shift around remote work rather. It's not just about COVID, it's not just a temporal moment in time. There is a generational shift and thus, if that is the case, I need employees to come live here. So that is why I said I'm here to run Philadelphia like it's home. I want it to be the best place to raise a family, to start your, uh, to afford your first home, to start a business, and to build a future. I think when we make Philadelphia that vibrant, clean, safe place where your children feel good to go to school, we have a fighting chance to be the most competitive city in the country. Um, and I do believe that when we do that, when we make Philadelphia the kind of place that Philadelphians actually want to live in, it will attract more people to our city um, for generations to come. Hello, I um, don't want to get into a debate here, but I would just comment, um, it's curious how the percentage of people who are back in the office can vary fairly significantly. So Philadelphia's in the 40s, but you have cities in America in the 60s, and internationally, 
there are countries in the 90s. So I'm not sure remote work, I just something to think about, is in fact the paradigm shift that, that is, it's not happening internationally. Um, taxes, which you just touched on. So we all know the facts, I'm not gonna repeat them, about anemic job growth. The city has just underperformed consistently. Do you consider that a factor to the reason we have the high poverty rate? And, do you, and how do you think about increasing the number of jobs in the city and the interrelationship between that and this you know, relatively significant tax burden? Um, so I will say one quick comment. Um, one of the reasons why other nations actually do go back to work is because one, they have excellent health care. Um, they have a modern health care system, unlike the United States of America. Um, their poverty rates are extremely much lower than the United States of America. And they have very different work environments um, in many other parts of the country, <laughs> many other parts of the world rather as well, including like lots of the paid leave and support for families and other, lots of other different types of things. So I just wanted to say that very quickly. Um, is the question about poverty or about taxes? The interrelationship <laughs> between jobs, poverty, and taxes. Your, your view on that, yeah. So my view on poverty is that in a city where almost 37% of children are born into poverty, that this is not a situation that happens by accident. This is a situation, whether intentional or not, is largely manufactured. And it's a large reason why I don't think about poverty in terms of poor people. I think about poverty in this city in terms of impoverished si systems that further impoverish people. Um, that they take away wealth, that we over subsidize wealth, we exploit poverty, and we do lots of things to keep people down. Because I can't imagine another place in the world that would have so many people living in sub abject poverty and then to be sure that if they did, that they would live in substandard housing, that they would have more dangerous neighborhoods, that they would have fewer city services and that their children were less likely to go to a quality public school. That is a city that impoverishes. That is not a city of poverty. That is a city that impoverishes its own people. And that is a very big difference. And it's why, in my vision of what a mayor needs to do, everything has to be different. It is not the same old practices that we have traditionally done that haven't actually moved the needle on poverty, haven't raised up black and brown uh, economic development or wealth practices, haven't moved the needle on educational practices, and frankly have not have failed to grow Philadelphia as a city. So. Um, for my vision on how things work, um, I look at the health and well-being of Philadelphia. Um, and I'm looking at it through the lens of what matters the most uh, to people here. We talked about jobs and how we grow them and how we take care of them. I've been very clear and an unabashed supporter of unionization. I believe very strongly that the city had to be proactive about expanding certain labor rights like a fair workweek law, that in a $7.25 an hour state allowed actually people to have advanced work schedules so that people didn't have to worry about whether they could um, meet their rent or whether they could manage uh, childcare or taking care of an elderly person or even going to college or having a second job. Um, those types of proactive things are sending a message to some of our largest companies that we need to continue to raise wages, to raise the quality of jobs in this city as we continue to attract, uh, uh, as we continue to attra attract new ones. Um, but I'm also very clear because I think that, um, Della, you said it very beautifully, is that we do need to invest in a creative new workforce. The jobs of the future don't exist right now. And I think it's very clear that, um, that we need to spend more time on entrepreneurship, on exciting the creative potential of young people right now who are not that interested in a lot of the jobs that are being promoted and practiced and sold to people. Um, and that we need a lot of opportunities both in our schools, in, um, in our uh, commerce department, which is what we spend out of our city budget one quarter of 1% of our funds in our Commerce Department, 15 million out of a $5.9 billion budget. I mean, what kind of economic opportunity are we really thinking for ourselves? Um, really accelerating and investing in people means delivering that mission out to folks and not just saying, um, you know, getting the lowest wage possible or replacing people with $85,000 jobs that may not need meet the needs of young people right now and where they may not see themselves an economic opportunity. I'm dedicated to making 
making and bridging that gap. And we need a concerted governmental approach to doing that. It's not going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen because the market wants it to happen. It's not going to happen because of the individual dint and hard work of some really extraordinary young people. It's going to happen because a city leads it, and it starts with the mayor. Thank you, Ms. Gibb.